Hello, my name is Meredith Barad. I'm a clinical associate professor of pain medicine at Stanford University. And today we're going to talk about migraine. I have no relevant disclosures and I will be discussing off-label use of medications in this presentation. Our learning objectives are to be able by the end of this module to confidently diagnose migraine and its subtypes, to learn the basic preventive strategies for migraine management, to learn the basic rescue strategies for migraine management, and to understand the pharmacology of the new preventive and rescue medications on the market for migraine. So let's talk about first, what is migraine? How do we define migraine? David Dodick, in his 2018 review of migraine in Lancet, defined migraine as a chronic neurological disorder characterized by attacks of moderate or severe headache and reversible neurological and systemic symptoms. And I think that's an excellent definition because it not only encompasses the pain associated with migraine, but also all the extra symptoms that go along with migraine, because migraine is not just a pain experience, as we're going to talk about uh, today. It's much more than that. So the way we diagnose headache disorders is defined and guided by the International Classification of Headache Disorders. We are currently on volume three. And this is sponsored by the International Headache Society. And this definition alludes to these extra symptoms, not only just pain, but there are extra symptoms that, uh, that make the migraine diagnosis. So in order to have the migraine diagnosis, you need to have a recurrent headache disorder manifesting in attacks lasting four to 72 hours. The characteristics are unilateral in location, at least at onset, pulsating in quality, moderate to severe in intensity, and aggravated by routine or physical activity. In addition, during the headache, at least one of the following must be met. The patient need, either needs to have photophobia and phonophobia or nausea and or vomiting. So there are, again, extra symptoms, not just pain, that go into making this diagnosis. Let's take a look at the epidemiology of migraine. Migraine is very common. The one year prevalence in the general population is 12%. And the annual and lifetime prevalence in women is 18%, uh, annually 33% over the course of a lifetime. And in men, it's 6% annually and 13% over the course of a lifetime. About 10 to 10% of school aged children also experience migraines. And in the pre-pubertal years, the rate of onset of migraines is slightly higher in boys than in girls. But after menstru menstruation occurs, menarche, that usually shifts to a female predominance. Migraine is the most prevalent in our prime years of function, the ages of 25 to 55. Uh, and we see the prevalence rise through early adult life and then fall after midlife, midlife or around menopause. Um, migraine is the second most prevalent neurologic condition worldwide. And in uh, the Lancet does a study that it puts out every couple of years looking at uh, disability, years lived with disability. Um, and in terms of neurologic conditions, it's the second most disabling neurologic condition. Um, and the leading of all the leading causes of years lived with disability by in 2018, migraine was, was number seven on this list. Sorry, this was 2015 was the study, but they published it in 2018. Um, and migraine was number seven on this list. Migraine is a genetic disease. And we know this from looking at families and seeing migraine passed down from grandmothers 
to mothers, to daughters. Um, many, many families will have a history of migraine. But there have been some very nice uh, um, genomic-wide association studies and a meta-analysis of those studies uh, involving uh, over 59,000 individuals with migraine um, noted 44 independent single nucleotide polymorphisms to be significantly associated with migraine risk. And, and these are still being investigated and we're not gonna go into that today, but the point is, is that there seems to be m multiple different genetic, genetic factors that go into to migraine. So again, going back to this idea that migraine is more than the pain, um, the defining migraine features have been fleshed out in many studies uh, looking at the symptoms, symptomology, and the phenotype of migraineurs. And um, on average, about 94% of migraineurs have photophobia, 91% have phonophobia, and 72% have dizziness. Um, many patients will have, 70% of patients will have non-aura visual symptoms, all blurry vision, double vision that are present after the aura is over during the course of the headache. 30% will have osmophobia or uh, sensitivities to smells. 70% of patients have cutaneous allodynia. That's the perception of pain when painful, when non-painful stimuli are applied to the skin. 60% are unilateral. And um, that is not always the case because pain can change sides between attacks. And even during an attack, the pain can move. Um, so that's the way I talk about unilaterality is that the headache does usually start unilaterally, but oftentimes will spread during the course of a migraine. About 50% of patients feel the headache is throbbing and about 90% feel that it's aggravated by physical activity or head movement. The median time to peak intensity is one hour, and the median duration of a headache is 24 hours. And one thing I wanted to point out is that neck pain can often accompany migraines. Anne Calhoun in 2010 wrote a, wrote a paper that looked at this, and 75% of the patients in her study had neck pain with their migraine episodes. Uh, so oftentimes, neck pain accompanies migraine. 40% of patients have sinus pain or pressure, and 50% of patients have cranial autonomic features. So sometimes we can be mm, sidetracked or um, send off referrals to different subspecialties. We may be to focus on the sinuses or to focus on the neck pain, but we might be missing the the need to treat the migraine. Migraine can occur at any, kind, any time of the day, but more commonly occurs, interestingly, during sleep, upon awakening, or shortly after rising in the morning. So it doesn't have to be that a patient has sleep apnea when they have a headache in the morning. It could just be migraine. Migraine has stages and um, or phases, if you'd like to call them that. It moves from prodrome, to aura, to the actual headache, and then to the postrome. And we're going to talk about all of these stages. The prodrome can occur hours or days before the onset of the pain. Uh, people experience fatigue, impaired concentration, neck stiffness. They can also have some psychological symptoms, and we're going to talk about why that might be. But anxiety, depression, irritability, arousal, or drowsiness can also uh, occur. They can have some light sensitivity. They can have lacrimation as a manifestation of cranial parasympathetic symptoms. And then they have these general symptoms that may be due to height to the hypothalamus uh, being stimulated, yawning, increased urination, nausea, diarrhea, and food cravings. Um, there have been brain studies that actually do see areas of the brain that are active during this 
this prodromal phase. And that may explain some of these characteristics. For example, the hypothalamus and the midbrain ventral tegmentum are stimulated during the premonitory phase. And that may explain the yawning, the increased urination, the nausea, the diarrhea, and the food cravings. And then the connections to the limbic system uh, from these areas may explain the psychological symptoms of prodrome. The stimulation of the periaqueoductal gray may um, be responsible, it's likely responsible for some of the pain and the general overall increased pain during the premonitory phase. The stimulation of the locus ceruleus uh, is responsible for possibly responsible for sensory modulation um, and the facilitation or disinhibition of the tri of trigeminal nociception. And the occipital cortex, the stimulation of the occipital cortex may be causing the photophobia. And then the stimulation we see in, or the activation we see in the nucleus tract solitarius may be contributing to the nausea. The aura is next. And aura is defined as a visual sensory language disturbance associated with brainstem dysfunction. It can last between five and 60 minutes and occurs before the headache. In, there are rare subtypes of migraine that we're not going to review today, known as hemiplegic migraine. Um, and in those cases, uh, motor deficits might occur. But again, that's very rare. Um, Aura will rarely persist for over 60 minutes. Um, and it can occur with or following the onset of the headache. So sometimes patients can still be in aura when the migraine starts. The most common type of aura is again, this visual type of aura. And 90% of patients have visual aura. There's, there's different forms of visual aura. There is um, something called spark photopsia, which is the hemi field, a hemi field, so one field of vision with unformed flashes of light. It's a positive uh, symptom versus a scotoma, which is a partial loss of vision. And so that would be a negative visual symptom. There's tachopsia, which is the fortification spectrum. And you can see that's what's uh, in this picture here. A fortification spectrum is uh, similar to the uh, fortification walls of a, of a fortress in medieval towns. Um, and it's a, it's a zigzaggy shape that many, many migraineurs see with their, with their visual auras. Um, and the second most common type of aura is paresthesias. Uh, usually they involve the hand and the perioral area, and the next would be the arm. And they can become bilateral and they can progress or march and transition from positive to negative. Expressive language dysfunction or aphasia is the least common aura symptom. Um, and higher cortical deficits like apraxia or agnosia, they're rare, but they can occur during migraine attack. We think that aura is due to cortical spreading depression. And this is, this is a process where the depolarization of glia and neuronal cell membranes results in a disruption of ionic gradients. Um, and this leads to a, a rise in extracellular potassium concentrations, a release of glutamate, and a transient increase of, of blood flow followed by a decrease in cerebral blood flow. The spread of this cortical spreading depression is like a wave that gradually and slowly spreads across neural tissue at a rate of about two to six millimeters per minute. And it is similar um, to the progression of the aura that people see visually. So for example, people have noticed, have noted their aura as a fortification spectra and noted that it has 
spreads at a rate of, or grows at a rate of two to six millimeters per minute. And cerebral oligemia has been seen on cerebral blood flow imaging during aura in human beings, also kind of spreading at this rate. Um, we think that this unregulated or dysregulated release of glutamate is really the most important part of the pathogenesis of CSD. CSD may be the main cause of aura, but it only results in visual aura if it's present in the occipital cortex. There may be areas where CSD occurs, but it's clinically silent. So there may be people that have aura that we don't recognize uh, and it, it's harder to observe. Um, but what we think CSD does is that it modulates both the trigeminal nociceptors and the vasculature, which are also innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So CSD activates the dural trigeminal nociceptors. It also causes neurons and glia to release factors that activate dural vasculature, that affect dural vasculature and can cause either dilation or constriction of dural vasculature. Trigeminal afferents in the vascular system then relay this signal to the brainstem. And this leads to a loss, uh, to, some, to inhibition of the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. So just to expand on this, when we get into the pain experience, it's because these dural nociceptors are activated. They're activated by, by the activation of the trigeminal sensory pathways um, that not only innervate the, uh, the dura, but also innervate the eye, the large cerebral and peel blood vessels, and the dural venous sinuses. And these are unmyelinated fibers, and they're generally coming from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, but also from these upper cervical spinal roots. Those also uh, get activated as well. And the peripheral trigeminal sensory afferents then converge back on to the second order neurons in the trigeminal cervical complex. So we have both trigeminal and cervical nerve roots converging on the trigeminal cervical complex. And then we get a pain experience um, that includes essentially the whole head. Um, it is often very prominent around the orbital region. And that is due to the V1, the predominantly V1 uh, um, irritation of, uh, or activation of the nerve. And then after, after the second order neurons within the trigeminal cervical complex are activated, then they would send projections up to the brainstem, hypothalamic and subcortical regions, the thalamus, and then further on to the cortical regions that process nociceptive signals from the trigeminal vascular system. And then, you know, that causes more excitation. So we have a sort of full loop of excitation that starts with cortical spreading depression, activating dural nociceptors, leading to activation of trigeminal fibers that in turn causes activation of the trigeminal cervical complex and back up the brainstem and back up to the cortical centers. Uh, and this is just a little bit of a, of a graphical representation of the dura and the trigeminal nerves that not only innervate peripheral structures, but also innervate the dura and the vasculature of the, uh, the dural vasculature or the cerebral vasculature. All right, so we have this pain experience that lasts four to 72 hours um, until the brain is able to kind of settle, settle the system back down and re-exert uh, control over the ex excitation. And that takes a toll on the brain. And what the brain is left with is a post-dromal phase defined as the time to the, by the, when the headache resolves to when the individual feels completely back to baseline. 
And this occurs in about 80% of individuals with migraine and usually lasts less than 12 hours, but sometimes can persist for longer than 24 hours. Um, and it's accompanied by asthenia, fatigue, somnolence, impaired concentration, photophobia, irritability, nausea. People describe it as being hungover, essentially. And patients also report a low threshold for, for periods of recurrent brief head pain. For example, they'll valsalva or they're torn their head quickly and they'll get a, a sharp stabbing pain or a headache, a short-term headache. When a headache is greater than 15 days a month, we call it chronic migraine. And you can imagine that um, if your headache lasts several days, uh, that you could fairly easily get into chronic migraine. Episodic migraine is actually 15 or fewer days per month, and chronic migraine is greater than 15 days a month. And it's, it's broken down a little bit more in this slide where we have low-frequency episodic migraine one to seven days a month, high-frequency episodic migraine eight to 15 days a month, and chronic migraine greater than 15 days per month. How does migraine become chronic? There are many different risk factors for chronicity. There are modifiable risk factors, which include just a high baseline attack frequency, uh, as well as overuse of acute medications or rescue medications, caffeine consumption, excessive caffeine consumption, snoring, obesity, and the inadequate acute treatment of migraine attacks are all thought to be things that we can modify as physicians and as patients. There are non-modifiable risk factors, which include being female, um, the presence of allodynia, which may suggest some uh, changes that are occurring in the brain, head injury, uh, low socioeconomic status also seems to be a non-modifiable risk factor, depression, anxiety, and comorbid pain disorders. Iron deposition in inhibitory pain circuits is possibly uh, a risk factor. Um, and there may be some sensitization of sensory neural structures, and there might be some functional and structural changes in cortical and subcortical brain regions that could modulate this transition. Um, the latter studies are imaging studies in smaller groups of people, so it's not entirely clear what, what is happening. The incidence of chronic migraine among people with episodic migraine is about 25 to 3%, and the prevalence of chronic migraine in the general population is 2% at any given time, and about 8% of the migraine population has chronic migraine. The, the diagnosis is available online at ICHD3. Um, there's all, there are also screening tools that help identify migraine and chronic migraine briefly and quickly, and those can enhance the likelihood uh, that the patient has migraine, and then that patient might receive some managements. For example, this is ID migraine. It's very simple. It's just three questions. And during the last three months, did you have any of the following with your headaches? Did you feel nauseated or sick to your stomach when you had a headache? Did light bother you a lot more than when you don't have a headache? And did, were your headaches limiting your ability to work or study uh, or do what you needed to do? And the validation studies show that an affirmative or a positive response to two of the three questions yields a sensitivity of 81% and a specificity of 75%. So it's, it's a pretty nice initial tool to look for migraine in your patients. The other big culprit that we see very commonly with migraine patients it, that causes chronification is medication overuse. Um, the one-year prevalence of medication overuse headache is about 1% to 3%. And 50% of patients seen in headache specialty centers overuse medication, and at least 50% of people with chronic migraine in the general population overuse medication. And that makes sense, right? Their head is hurting every day. They need to take something to get through the pain. And so they start using medication more and more frequently. It's a, it's a slippery slope. 
But what we know is that the use of rescue medications really more than 10 days a month um, for opioids, for butalbital containing products, for triptans, for ergots, and for combination analgesics can lead to medication overuse headache. And the use of simple analgesics like NSAIDs uh, more than 15 days a month can lead to medication overuse headache. The greatest risk of progressing from episodic migraine to chronic migraine is associated with opioids and butalbital containing medications like Fioracet or Fioranol. This can occur in as as few as five doses per month for the Fioranol, Fioracet. Individuals with chronic migraine who overuse medication have even poorer quality of life, greater disability, greater losses in productivity than people who have migraine without medication overuse. So it really is important to make your patients aware of this issue and to treat them with a preventive medication if you sense that they are starting to overuse acute rescue medications. So this brings us to how we treat migraines. For my patients, I like to have a migraine management plan. I like to touch on three big areas. Number one is their lifestyle. Number two is preventive medication. And number three is acute medication. For lifestyle, I focus on a regular schedule. Migraineurs often find that triggers are changes in their schedule. So if they have too much sleep or too little sleep, they eat too much or they eat not enough, they drink too much or they drink not enough, some change to their regular schedule can oftentimes trigger a migraine. So I tell them, go to bed at the same time every day, wake up at the same time every day, eat regular meals every day, either three meals at the same time every day or six small meals, depending on your preference. I tell them to eat protein-based meals, which helps your body metabolize calories more regularly rather than carbohydrates, which gives you a big boost and then drops you back down. And I tell them to limit their caffeine to a small but regular dose. So one cup of coffee every day at the same time, Monday through Sunday. I tell them that they need to exercise regularly. Um, and I really emphasize the regular, regular, regular strategies. Prevention is indicated for patients who have more than four headache days a month. And acute medications are not to be used more than 10 days a month. So we then spend some time talking about prevention and acute medication choices. So the AAN came up with a practice parameter looking at the levels of evidence for medications. And uh, they published this um, practice parameter giving level A evidence, meaning it is established as clinically effective and should be offered for topiramate, Depakote, metoprolol, propranolol, and timolol. They felt there was level B evidence, meaning it was probably clinically effective and should be considered to atenolol, natalol, amitriptyline, and venlafaxine. And they gave level C evidence, meaning it's possibly clinically effective and may be considered to candesartan, lisinopril, clonidine, guaianephacine, carbamazepine, nabivalol, pindolol, and ciproheptadine. Now these uh, this parameter is in the process of being re-evaluated and updated, and that is mainly due to the um, new classes of medications on the market. But it's not fully in agreement with uh, some of the other societies. For example, the European Federation of Neurosurgical Specialties has a, param has a, a guideline, and the Canadians have a guideline. And you can see that there are some differences. For example, gabapentin was um, not evaluated by the, a, the American Headache Society's guideline, but it was given a, a level C evidence by the e, European guideline. And it was thought to be thought to have some strong, moderate quality evidence by the Canadian guidelines. So each guideline, each group of people evaluates the, the data slightly differently. Um, 
and I think the point of it is that there's maybe not one right answer uh, and, and stay, and we need to kind of keep updating and keep researching these medications. Now there's a new class of medications that have come onto the market in the last few years, and that is the calcitonin gene related peptide monoclonal antibodies and the antagonists. Um, the monoclonal antibodies are indicated for prevention and the CGRP antagonists are indicated for rescue. And we'll talk about both today. Um, here's a little graphic. There's two different types of CGRP monoclonal antibodies. One uh, attacks the receptor and that is amovig or attaches to the, to the CGRP receptor. And, and the others uh, are an actual monoclonal antibody to CGRP itself. CGRP has been studied for a long time. It has been a, a protein of interest for a long time. Um, it is, its main source, the main source of CGRP is located chiefly in the pri primary trigeminal afferents. CGRP, when given to a, a patient, can cause a migraine-like attack. Uh, when given to a non-healthy control, it does not do that. CGRP serum levels are elevated during attacks, and decreased levels of CGRP in the plasma correspond to decreases in pain after a patient is given sumatriptan. And so all these converging lines of interest made this a very exciting protein to work with. Um, and after several iterations of various CGRPs, they, uh, CGRP modulating drugs, they came out with the monoclonal antibodies. Um, there's four on the mar there are four on the market. Uh, Arenumab, which is called Amavig, Galcanazumab, which is called Imgality, Fremenazumab, AGV, and Eptanazumab, which is Viepti. Um, these drugs have, in general, fewer side effects than the oral preventives that we previously discussed. And the thought is that the reason why they have fewer side effects is that they don't cross the blood-brain barrier in high concentrations, so they don't disrupt the central nervous system, and they're metabolized by the reticular endothelial system, not the liver or the kidney. They also have a long half-life. You can do monthly or, in the case of HIV, quarterly dosing, and that can really um, make it much easier for migraine migraineurs to, to utilize. Uh, this slide shows the various differences between the medications. So as I said before, uh, they are all uh, targeting the peptide with the, acceptor, except, with the exception of Amavig, which targets the receptor. Uh, they are humanized antibodies, meaning that they are 90, greater than 90% human with the exception of Arenumab or Amavig, which is fully human. Their formulations vary. Uh, Amavig can, comes in two doses, 70 milligrams or 140 milligrams. Galcanazumab comes in 120 milligrams for migraine, uh, but you start with a loading dose of 240 milligrams. Age of E can be dosed 225 milligrams every month or 675 milligrams every three months. Galcanazumab and Galady is also indicated for cluster headache. It's the only one that has an additional FDA uh, indication, and that's given at a dose of 300 milligrams per month uh, after the onset of cluster. These are the treatment outcome studies, and what you'll see here is um, what we're looking at is the mean decrease in monthly headache days, and we're looking at the 50% response rate the 75% response rate, and the 100% response rate. So, ha so, so for example, in this phase three study of arenumab for episodic migraine, 246 patients, they showed that 30% of patients had a 50% decrease in their headache, monthly headache days. 12% of patients had a 75% decrease in their monthly headache days, and very interesting, 6% of patients had a 100% decrease in their monthly headache days. Um, 
galconazumab also showed uh, in their phase three study for episodic migraine, um, a little bit higher of a response rate with 60% of their patients uh, having a 50% response rate, but also a higher placebo rate uh, compared to irenumab. Um, again, they also showed a 11%, 11 percent, 11 and a half percent, 100 percent response rate, response rate, which is, which is pretty exciting. Now, the the last two studies um, are for HOV for chronic migraine and Viepti for chronic migraine, and they do show also some very high 50 percent response rates for chronic migraine patients. But again, they also show some very high placebo rates as well. So I can't really tell you which one is better or worse. Um, I think it's probably important to try them all now uh, as we're learning about them and, and, uh, and see which one works. And probably we'll find that some work better for, for some subsets of patients. The European Headache Federation and the American Headache Society have both come out with position statements on how to integrate their new mi the new migraine treatments. And I think it's interesting to look at them both side by side. So when we ask the question, which patients are eligible for MABs, um, both, both societies say that either patients with episodic migraine or chronic migraine who have not uh, been successfully treated with two or more preventives can be candidates for monoclonal antibodies. How should other preventive treatments be managed when using MABs? Um, for EM, the European Headache Federation asks or says that it's probably better to discontinue other oral preventives, but for chronic migraine, it's okay to continue oral preventives, although Botox should be stopped. The American Headache Society thinks that it's okay to just uh, continue their existing regimen and add on MABs. Uh, and then reassess efficacy before making further changes. So it doesn't sound like there's a strong consensus in that regard. When should the MABs be stopped? The Europeans suggest to reconsideration after six to 12 months. American Headache Society says to reassess after three months and only continue in if reduction in monthly migraine days are greater than 50% or a clinically meaningful improvement is achieved in, in the MIDAS um, the HIT-6 and the MPFID, which are uh, measures of functionality in migraine. Which patients should not use MABs? Um, the American Headache Society gave no recommendations. The Europeans said that it they were not recommended for patients who are pregnant or nursing, for patients who have a history of alcohol or drug abuse, for patients who have a history of cerebrovascular or cardiovascular disease or severe mental disorders. Um, so just for our own knowledge before we go on, there does seem to be CGRP located in the heart and CGRP located in the gut. And um, constipation is a big side effect of some of these medications. Um, uh, and, and Amavig, which was the first on the market, recently added uh, an addendum to their safety labeling saying that this drug could cause high blood pressure. So it may be that if somebody already has uh, high blood pressure or especially difficult to control high blood pressure, that these are not good medications for these patients and that blood pressure should be monitored uh, while a patient is on a monoclonal antibody. So where does Botox fit in? Botox prior to MABS was indicated for the prevention of chronic migraine. If you had more than 15 headache days a month and you had tried and failed more than three preventive medications, uh, most insurances would approve the use of Botox. Recently, well, not so recently, but in 2018, um, there was a very nice consensus statement on the guidelines on the use of Botox in chronic migraine. And um, I thought they had some good, uh, good questions and good discussion uh, that I wanted to review. So in their, in their guideline, they asked the question, for patients with chronic migraine, is treatment with Botox effective and well tolerated? And by Botox, they mean this defined what we call the preempt protocol, 155 to 195 units given every 12 weeks. Um, 
And they were looking at this as compared to placebo or other prophylactic treatments and looking to see if there was a meaningful reduction in headache days with acceptable side effects. And they concluded that Botox is recommended for the treatment of patients with chronic migraine and considered an effective and well-tolerated treatment. They gave the quality of evidence high and the strength of recommendation strong. So for clinical question number two, they looked at which patients should be offered Botox, which patients with chronic migraine should be offered Botox. And basically they said that the patients need to have failed at least two to three other medications um, unless maybe there's a contraindication due to a comorbid disorder. And if they have failed that, then they can, uh, can be a candidate for Botox. Um, I skipped question number three because it wasn't relevant to this talk, but clinical question number four was how should treatment with Botox be administered? And the conclusion was that it should be administered via the preempt protocol, so the, the main protocol that we have for Botox. Question number five, when can a de novo patient be considered a non-responder for Botox? And it is recommended that it patients should be defined as non-responders if they have less than 30% reduction in headache days per month um, during their treatment. However, other factors can be looked at, such as headache intensity, disability, and patient preference. Uh, treatment should be stopped if the patient does not respond in the first two to three treatment cycles. So it's not a one-time thing. Usually we need to have more than one try at Botox. And how should responders to Botox be managed over time? The consensus was that they need to be, they need to compare four weeks before and four weeks after each treatment cycle. And it's recommended to stop treatment in patients with a reduction to less than 10 headache days per month for three months. So if you're down to less than 10 headache days per month for three months, the the recommendation by the Europeans is to stop Botox, um, but other factors such as headache intensity, disability, and patient preference should also be considered. Patients should be reevaluated every four to five months after stopping Botox to make sure that the patient has not returned to CM. And these recommendations are best based on expert opinion. In the United States, I would say our practice, uh, our practice is not to stop Botox um, as easily as this. And that is mainly due to patient preference. Patients are very scared once they achieve some um, uh, consistent and stable uh, period in their lives of headache freedom. They don't want to stop their Botox. Um, and, and I don't think that we have a lot of good evidence suggesting that we should. So this is a photo of the location of the injection sites for Botox. Botox is delivered in 155 units in 31 different locations in five unit aliquots every 12 weeks. There's an additional 40 units that can be given in specific areas based on a follow the pain approach. So if a patient is saying, I have some right-sided trapezius pain, you can inject an extra five units in the trap. Or I have some left temporalis pain that's very strong, you can inject an extra five units in the temporalis. Um, and this was developed, this, this protocol was developed really by a group think with many experts in the field of headache discussing where their patients felt pain and, and um, where they had tried Botox in previous studies. And I would say that this really does corroborate my clinical experience uh, with where my patients uh, um, have their pain. This is a fairly benign process. The whole injection takes about five minutes. Most patients tolerate it really well. Um, and is it, it's a very low side effect profile. The biggest side effects of these injections are um, sort of an inability to raise your eyebrows, which is due to the freezing of the frontalis. And if there's sort of too much freezing of the frontalis, you can feel like your eyebrows might hang a little bit low or perhaps if you have some blepharo, um, some extra skin hanging down, you're ready for a blepharoplasty, uh, the, your tendency would be to elevate your frontalis at baseline. Uh, and 
we and weakening the frontalis would make it seem like you have a little bit of a droopy eyelid. Um, the other thing, the other major side effect is some increased neck pain, and that can typically occur when patients have too weak of neck extensors to tolerate the neck injections. And so when they lift up their neck, when they extend their neck, um, the neck extensors that were injected uh, cause weakness and that causes it to be more difficult to raise your head up. So that, that, and that causes more neck pain because you're recruiting other cervical muscles. So those are the two major problems that we see with Botox, but again, pretty minor compared to many of the other treatments. Okay, so let's move on to rescue medications now. And rescue medications are indicated for when you actually have a migraine, not for pre prevention of migraine. Um, the treatment, the mainstay of treatments is the triptans. And in a, in a randomized controlled trial meta-analysis by Cameron et al. in 2015, they showed that standard dose triptans relieved headaches within two hours in 42 to 75% of the patients, and that there was a two hour sustained freedom from pain in 18 to 50% of the patients. Um, 29 to 50% of sustained headache relief of patients had sustained headache relief at 24 hours, and 18 to 30% had sustained freedom from pain at 24 hours. So, drugs are good. They have good success rates. And in the absence of vascular risk factors, triptans have shown an overall favorable safety profile. And in, in some European countries, they are available without a prescription. The contraindications are due to their vascular effects. So they are mild vasoconstrictors. And um, there have been some associations with uh, with ischemic cerebrovascular events, with aneurysms, with artery dissections, and with pregnancy-related vascular events. So again, if we are, have any type of vascular issue with patients, including um, hypertension, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, then we cannot use triptans. Triptans are highly selective serotonin 1B and 1D receptor agonists. Um, they do have some activity at the 5-HT1F receptor, but not much. The location of the receptors is in the peripheral trigeminal sensory nerve endings and on neurons in the trigeminal cervical complex, the rostral brainstem, and the thalamus. Triptans also bind to 5-HT1B receptors in on intracranial and extracranial and systemic blood vessels, and that, that leads to their vasoconstrictive effect. Most of them do not pass the blood-brain barrier, um, and, that, and that's important. Their F effect is probably occurring in peripherally. It's probably not occurring uh, in, in the brain. Uh, and the, while the incidence of adverse vascular events is rare, when triptans are used appropriately, there still are these certain groups that we need to be very cautious in. There's many formulations of triptans, and I would encourage everybody to get familiar with them. But the basic rule is not to start low and go slow, but to start high. Because if a patient, if you put a patient on 25 milligrams of sumatriptan and it doesn't work, they're not going to want to try it again the next headache. They want something that works effectively. And so I will always put my patients on the highest dose unless I have some significant concern uh, of, a, of a side effect, some significant concern of side effects. Um, as you can see, there's many different kinds of triptans. They come in tablets, they come in nasal sprays, they come in subcutaneous injections, they come in suppositories, they come in oral dissolving tablets. And I think the key is to figure out how rapidly one needs onset. For example, a tablet may not onset for 30 minutes, but an injection will onset in five minutes, six minutes, and a nasal spray may onset in 15 minutes. 
I also want to think about the half-life of the drug. So the shortest acting triptans are Suma, triptan, zolmatriptan, rizotriptan, almatriptan, those all onset in about 30 minutes, but have a half-life of about two, two and a half hours. Whereas elitriptan has a half-life of about four hours, emerge or neurotriptan, a half-life of six hours, and frovitriptan, a half-life of 24, 25 hours. Um, and I will use the longer acting triptans for patients whose headaches sort of come on more slowly but last longer. And I'll use the shorter acting triptans for the, for the patients whose headaches come on really uh, rapidly and intensely but don't last as long. You can take one triptan at onset and repeat it again after two hours with the exception uh, to the longer acting triptans. For RELPAX, you probably want to repeat it after four hours. For Emerge, repeat after six hours. And for FROBA, repeat after 24 hours. Um, in uh, the, the American Headache Society did come up with uh, an evidence-based uh, assessment of the acute treatment of migraines. And they gave um, all the triptans level A evidence. Uh, they gave some INSEADS level A evidence, and they gave some other sprays like ergotamine uh, nasal spray, migranol, um, and actually they even gave an opioid, butorphanol, uh, um, level A evidence. I would say I would not encourage you to use opioids. I do not think it's a good idea for your patients. Um, I would say that the triptans would be the mainstay. INSEADS can be good if they are effective and there are some newer NSAIDs on the market since this practice parameter came out, Cambia, which is more rapidly dissolving. It's a powdered diclofenac. Um, and then Migranol, which uh, for a while was very, very expensive, has now become more affordable. And so that is also a good option for, pay, for rescue for patients. Uh, level B medications are the antiemetics. Um, some of the other formulations of ergots, uh, and some other varieties of NSAIDs, and then some ran random assortments of medications uh, listed below. And now we have some new medications on the market for acute migraine. Number one is lasmididan, and that's known as Ravau. Ravau is a serotonin 1F uh, receptor agonist. Um, so the advantage of the 1F receptor agonist is that it does not have any vasoconstriction, vasoconstrictive properties. Um, the dose is either 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, or 200 milligrams uh, taken orally. No more than one dose should be taken in 24 hours. And this drug does cross the blood-brain barrier. So there is sort of a, an impairment warning that needs to be given to patients as with all new FDA uh, drugs that cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, it also has a Schedule 5, um, which has to do with its drug uh, liking. So subjects reported statistically significant higher drug liking scores than placebo and that in their studies, and that indicated that Ravau has some abuse, possibly has some abuse potential. Um, I guess we'll have to uh, see if that plays out or not, but they were required to make this a Schedule 5 medication. Uh, when we look at the uh, package insert from Lasmitidan, we see that their pain freedom at two hours was 28% uh, to 31%. So again, uh, even less than the most of the triptans. And their most bothersome symptom, which usually was photophobia, about 40% of patients felt relief in two hours. Um, so again, it's not, uh, it's not better than triptans, but it does have, it, it can be used in patients that have cardiovascular issues. The other new acute med on the market is uh, Ubrojupant, and that's known as Ubrelvi. It is a oral CGRP receptor antagonist. It is uh, dosed in 50 or 100 milligrams 
Uh, and a second dose, just like a tryptan, a second dose can be administered at least two hours after the initial dose. Um, it, the most common adverse reaction is nausea. Uh, it kicks in in about an hour and a half, so a little bit longer onset than most tryptans, but it lasts longer, about five to seven hours. Um, and it is, a, uh, it is metabolized hepatically through the CYP3A4 system. So uh, it's contraindicated for concomitant use with strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. Uh, and then looking at their uh, allergens, this is an allergen product, looking at their package insert, we see that their pain freedom as, uh, at, at two hours is actually pretty low, 19%, uh, 21% in their 100 milligram dosing. Um, they approach 40% in their most bothersome symptom at two hours, and they get up to 60% in pain relief, which is not pain freedom, but decreased pain. Um, and then they have a pretty low sustained pain freedom at 24 hours. So again, you know, these are not, uh, not miraculous medications. Um, Remigipant is called Nurtec, and this is an oral dissolvable 75 milligram medication. They had, again, pain freedom, uh, 21% versus placebo. Pain relief, again, that's, that's very similar to Ubrojapant, 60% versus pretty high placebo rate there, 43%. Uh, use of rescue medications within 24 hours, 14%. Um, they are also uh, peaking in plasma concentration at one and a half hours and having about a half uh, the half-life of about five to seven hours. And, and this drug is also metabolized by CYP3A4, so you should avoid concurrent use of strong inhibitors or inducers. And here's just the data that we talked about already. So again, you know, this is not, not knocking it out of the ballpark here, but if you have failed, if your patient has failed tryptans or if tryptans are contraindicated, uh, this may, these may be medications to consider trying. Um, the final two things I want to touch on are non-pharmacologic strategies for managing migraine. So um, occipital nerve blocks are frequently come up in the discussion of how to manage migraine. And uh, there's a lot of debate about when they are for what type of migraine they should be used to manage. But it does seem like the best evidence is for this sort of transformed migraine, when migraine either becomes um, goes from episodic to chronic, or when migraine is, is pretty acute, an occipital nerve block can be beneficial for resetting, bringing things back down to their previous uh, levels. Um, intranasal sphenopalatine ganglion blocks are also um, a treatment on the market. And again, there's really been very few studies. One study that looked at this in, in the acute setting and seemed to be helpful in, in treating the acute exacerbations of migraine. There are also some non-invasive neuromodulatory products out on the market. And right now we have four of them out on the market. Um, we have uh, uh, this armband here on the left, which is uh, Theranica Nerivia, a uh, Nerivia Theranica. We have this uh, magnet here, which is called Enura. This is a uh, half Tesla magnet, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. This little supraorbital band sticker uh, nerve stimulator here, and that's called Cephaly. And this is a vagal nerve modulator. Uh, called gamma core, and um, these these strategies all have uh, some degree of evidence to support their the support their use. Um, most of them show about thirty percent uh, response response rate. Um, Theranica is uh, indicated for acute migraine. Um, Gamma core is also indicated for acute migraine, and then, and then TMS and, and, and cephaly is, in, uh, sorry, uh, Enura is indicated for acute migraine. Enura also has a preventive indication, as does gamma core and cephaly. 
Uh, here's a link to a nice review paper if you're interested in learning more about this. In conclusion, I hope that you have learned more about how to diagnose migraine. I hope you've learned some basic preventive strategies for migraine management, some basic rescue strategies for migraine management. Uh, and I hope you have learned a little bit about the pharmacology of the new preventive and rescue medications on the market for migraine. Thank you for listening, uh, and I hope you have a great day.